John Edmonds had always dreamed of owning his own ranch. He and his wife had been setting money aside and were beginning their search when they came across a 10-acre ranch in Buckeye, Arizona. John was immediately excited by the prospect. Plenty of land, a nice big home, a calm, quiet area away from your neighbors. But his wife Joyce was not so thrilled. The property frightened her. The isolation combined with an eerie vibe made her hesitant. However, John's commitment to the property was strong and eventually the couple decided to buy the place. They dumped everything they had into the purchase and were set to move in on the 1st of July, 1996. What John thought would be their personal oasis, primed with opportunity, quickly descended into nightmare. Let me welcome all of you to the stranger side. John and Joyce pulled into the driveway of their new home and parked the moving truck near the front door. It was around midday and the sky was clear and sunny. They hopped out of the truck and took in the views for a moment before heading inside to check out the house. Upon entering, they saw that all of the furniture and appliances had been left behind. Everything looked brand new. John and Joyce were puzzled why anyone would leave all of this behind. As well, they had no room for their own things. They were all packed in a truck that was due back the following day. They called the realtor, who told them to go into town for a few hours, and that he would handle it for them. Returning several hours later, the house was completely empty. John and Joyce were stunned by how quickly everything had been removed. John walked the house, checking rooms. Everything appeared to have been cleaned out. He then decided to check the backyard, and as he stepped outside, he noticed that the pool, which had been drained and empty earlier, was now filled to the brim with all the furniture and appliances from the house. He was shocked and furious. He contacted the realtor again and asked him why all of this stuff was in the pool. He questioned him about who he had sent to do the job, but the realtor quickly interjected and told him that he had nothing to do with it. He said he had tried to contact the past owners, but their number was disconnected. John and Joyce thought the situation was strange, but the realtor told them that it was their house now and they would have to deal with it on their own. Some days passed and John and Joyce had settled in. John found himself home alone on this particular day when a stranger approached the home. He was an odd-looking man with tattered, dirty clothes, rotten teeth, and carrying a machete in his hand. John watched him make his way onto his property. He stepped outside to confront the man. Can I help you? The man pointed the machete towards the home and said, I live here. Confused, John questioned him further. The past owner let you live here? John assumed the man had been squatting on the property, perhaps living in the shed. The stranger stared blankly at John for a moment and then spoke. I kill the monsters. John wasn't sure what to make of that, but he didn't want this random stranger with a machete wandering his property. He told the man he owned the place now, and that he needed to leave. He never saw the stranger again. John would begin piecing together some of the strange history of the home he lived in. His first tumble down the rabbit hole began when he contacted his local telephone company to have a phone line installed at his ranch. An appointment was scheduled for a technician to come out and install the line in a few days. When the time of his appointment rolled around, John waited most of the day for the technician to arrive, but he never did. John called the telephone company again, and they apologized and assured him that someone would be out there in a few days. The allotted appointment time came and went, and again, the installer never arrived. John called the company back a third time, frustrated at the entire situation, and spoke with the supervisor. She informed him that their technicians were contract employees, and that they had likely seen the home address on the ticket and refused to show up. John questioned her as to why, and he was told that his home had a bit of a reputation amongst the locals. Years prior to them living there, the place had been used as a brothel. It was then the site of a controversial government raid on a group of citizens deemed to be a national security threat. This was all during the era of Ruby Ridge and Waco. Many of the townspeople suggested foul play and ill intent by the government over this particular incident. Shortly after that, a young man had lost his mind and shot himself in the home. Over the next few months, John heard whispers around town concerning animal mutilations, UFOs, and other strange sightings by locals. He attempted to do more digging on his own, but most people were unwilling to open up about their experiences. Most of what John had been exposed to at this point were first and secondhand stories from people in the area and a bit of the odd history behind his ranch. That was until John had a first-hand experience of his own. He was driving from town back to his ranch one night when he caught a glimpse of several strange lights in the sky. They moved across the sky while appearing to follow each other, as if tied together by a string. 
They glowed an odd orange color and were bigger and brighter than any of the stars in the sky. He watched them cross the sky while he drove and disappear over the hills. This wouldn't be the only time John would see these lights in the night sky. It would be a consistent phenomenon going forward. But this initial event is what triggered John to dig deeper into some of the stories he had heard. As many more reports came in about the floating lights seen in the skies over Buckeye, the military decided to step in. The Barry Goldwater military base was about 12 miles away from John's ranch and had come forward claiming that the orange lights were simply test flares. Many locals considered the military base to be responsible for spreading misinformation and participating in the cover-up of strange UFO activity. The locals claimed they had seen flares before and they were absolutely certain that what they had seen in the sky that night were not flares. Nearly three months had passed since the Edmonds had moved into the ranch and John was on quiet alert. Strange things happened with the electricity in the house. Plugs all around the house would stop working and then start again at random. Tools would do the same. And then things began disappearing. Car keys and mail would disappear from one location and reappear in another sometime later. Other times things would vanish and reappear in the original location hours after. John thought he was losing his mind. He began purposefully placing items in specific locations and noting where he left them, only to find them gone when he returned. All of the stress was grating on John, and he felt like he was losing his mind. But the ranch was just getting started. The strange activity only increased as John began experiencing sudden pressure and temperature changes in his home. He described it as the feeling you get just before a storm, when the barometric pressure changes and the air cools, only far more intense. He also noticed that the environment would react to him in many instances. When he was stressed or angry, it would trigger things to happen. Plates falling from the table, TVs turning on by themselves, objects disappearing. The only thing that kept him grounded, feeling like he wasn't losing his grasp on reality, were that his animals reacted to the strange environmental phenomena as well. At that point, he knew it wasn't just in his head. Then one night, John was walking his property, checking to make sure everything was in order and that his animals were in their pens. When he got to the kennels for his Rottweilers, he found one of the kennel doors open. He searched around the kennel and found his dog's body nearby, completely flattened to the ground. He was smashed, as if crushed by a giant weight, but there was no blood or guts on the ground, no footsteps or traces of anything around the animal, no sign of what could have crushed a large dog in such a way, no signs of struggle, and he had not heard a sound from his other animals, including his other Rottweilers, who were only a few feet away. Many other animals on the ranch would die in similar ways, no noise, no notice, completely random, and absolutely mutilated in strange ways. Some appeared to have laser precision cuts on them, with sections of their bodies removed cleanly. No blood was found from these animals, just like the Rottweiler from before. It wasn't until John and Joyce began waking in the morning with strange scratch marks, cuts, bruises, and puncture wounds all over their bodies that they began to fear someone or something was trying to hurt them. By this point, John had been neck deep in the phenomena and was convinced something abnormal was tormenting them and their home. Joyce was not yet ready to make that leap, as she had not been witness to all the events that John had, as she was at work while John was home alone most of the day. John began stockpiling weapons, baseball bats, knives, guns, whatever he could get his hands on. He wasn't sure what to expect next, but he knew a war was coming. One evening, John and Joyce were getting ready to go have dinner in town. John finished up first and was watching TV while waiting on Joyce. About 10 minutes passed when Joyce came walking into the living room. John noticed that she had on a fancy red dress and had gotten dolled up for their dinner date. He wondered why she was so dressed up, as they were just going to a simple Tex-Mex restaurant to grab a bite to eat, but he didn't mention it. They drove to the restaurant, sat down, and ordered some food. Shortly after ordering, Joyce said she would be right back and got up to go to the restroom. Sitting at the table alone, John decided to check his phone. When he looked, he realized he had several missed calls from his home phone number. He instantly thought the ranch was playing tricks on him again. No one was home, so who could have called him from his house number? He called the home phone, and Joyce answered on the other end. Where did you go? The frustration in her voice was clear. You just left me. John was completely baffled. What do you mean I left you? I'm at the restaurant with you. His voice trailed off as he realized he hadn't really been paying attention when he got into the car with Joyce to leave the house, or when they got to the restaurant and ordered. He hadn't looked directly at his wife's face since leaving the house. Joyce spoke again. I'm at home, John. When I came out of the bedroom, you were already gone. If his wife was at home, then who was the woman in his truck? 
Who had he just sat down with for dinner? In complete shock and disbelief, John stared at the door to the woman's bathroom, near the back of the restaurant, waiting for whatever was with him to reappear. A few minutes later, Joyce stepped out of the bathroom and made her way back over to the table. John stared at her intently as she sat back down. This time he stared directly into her eyes. His gaze could have burned a hole through her. He immediately thought, this isn't my wife. But before he could even finish the thought, Joyce's eyes turned black. Not just the pupils, the entire eye. Solid black, dark as night. They stared back at him like bottomless pits and her face was expressionless. John quickly got up out of his chair, rushed out of the restaurant, jumped in his truck and sped home, never taking a second to look back. If you are enjoying the story so far, quickly hit that like button to let me know you want more. Okay, now back to the story. When he got home, he explained what had happened at the restaurant and Joyce immediately insisted on leaving the ranch, but John refused. He wasn't going to lose the war for his own home. This was John's first encounter with a doppelganger at the ranch, but it wouldn't be his last. John would encounter doppelgangers several times going forward, as would Joyce, and to make matters worse, the now commonplace disappearance of things on the property would only intensify. More stuff would disappear, but now it would fall out of the air and onto their heads, into their laps, or down their backs while they searched for it. Almost as if something sentient was toying with them. John had taken to sleeping with a baseball bat at the side of his bed. He had never woken during the night to anything strange at this point, but considering the injuries they consistently received while sleeping, John wanted to be ready to catch whatever it was in the act, if given the chance. It was around 3 a.m., and he jolted awake to the feeling of a small, cold hand dragging itself down his inner forearm. He leapt out of bed without a second thought, grabbed his bat, and swung in the direction of where he had felt the hand. He heard a hissing sound, like what you would hear when releasing helium from a balloon. He steadied himself and could just make out three small, gray alien creatures looking back at him. They had large heads, big bulbous black eyes, like insect eyes, and skinny bodies. A second later, they all three vanished, as if slipping behind an invisible curtain. After seeing the greys for the first time, the Edmonds theorized that perhaps they were being abducted while they slept. The fact that John and Joyce couldn't remember the abductions fit perfectly in line with what other abductees had claimed, and the numerous scars and wounds that they had no recollection of receiving only seemed to support the idea. Now that John had seen the greys, they were far less subtle with their actions going forward. He saw them all over his property. He would hit them with things, shoot them, stab them, yet none of it seemed to slow them down or prevent them from vanishing in front of his eyes. They simply hissed at him and scuttled off. John had trained himself to wake very easily now, being on guard for anything. He woke randomly one night to his wife levitating above the bed. He attempted to wake her to no avail, but then shook her and shouted at her. She opened her eyes. He pressed down on her shoulders and she sunk back onto the bed. Joyce stared at him blankly for a moment and then turned over and went back to sleep. She had no memory of the event the following morning. This happened many times. Each time Joyce would end up going further and further out of her bed, one time even levitating out of the room and towards the front door. Each time he would wake her, she would sit up in a trance-like state and make her way back towards the bedroom. One night John caught her levitating out of the room and decided to follow. She floated down the hallway. He noticed a beam of light attached to her as she moved, and then suddenly she was pulled through the wall as if it were made of smoke. John couldn't see Joyce anymore, but he could still see the beam of light piercing through the wall. He followed it out the front door and into the front yard, where he looked up and saw a massive floating disc about a hundred feet off the ground. His wife was floating in the air, moving slowly towards the craft. John ran and got his AK-47 and shot at the disc. It released Joyce, the craft and the beam disappeared, and she was dropped to the ground. Unlike other times Joyce had been awoken while levitating, she had a vivid recollection of this particular event. John began posting the events of the ranch online shortly after the attempted abduction of his wife. After shooting at the craft, however, the abduction attempts stopped completely and activity within the home slowed dramatically. This was until he encountered a brand new phenomenon on the ranch. John was walking his property as had become the norm for him. As he was finishing up, he turned towards the south, looking out across his backyard into the distant desert. What he saw could only be described as a giant 10 to 12 foot tall creature walking upright, like a man. John didn't react at all. He had seen so many crazy things on the ranch that this was just another oddity. He even took the time to name the creature. He deemed it the Michelin Man, named after the Michelin Tires mascot because of its broad body and massive height. He would see it several other times, sometimes closer to his home than he would have liked. He even fired at it with his rifles, but 
but the creature never seemed to respond. The few times John was able to see it from up close, its skin appeared to have the texture of a Brillo pad. Some months later, John was sitting in his backyard cleaning his guns and talking with his neighbor when a dark colored SUV pulled up to his front gate. Two men in black suits, black fedoras, and black sunglasses stepped out. John and his neighbor watched the men approach the gate and without pause, walk straight through the gate. To be clear, they didn't open the gate, they walked straight through the metal bars and into his yard. As they got closer, John could see they had pale, clammy skin. He described it as uncooked chicken skin. One of the men stopped and watched as the other walked over to John and leaned in close to him. He spoke in a strangely dry and ambivalent manner. You will stop posting your experiences online. John was confused and asked, what did you say? The man leaned in again and repeated in the same tone, you will stop posting your experiences online. The men turned and walked off. As they got to the fence line, once again they walked straight through the metal bars, hopped in their black SUV, and drove off. John followed the man in black's demand that he cease his online discussions about the ranch. He felt lost and out of answers and had built up a strong hatred for the greys and the related phenomena happening on his ranch. He especially hated that these things were slaughtering his animals and there was seemingly nothing he could do about it. But John had always believed that everyone is equipped with the tools they need to solve the task they are presented with in life. And as he searched for the tool required to solve this strange task, it presented itself in the oddest way. John was following a large truck on the road that was on the brink of overflowing, packed to the top with junk. A Christmas tree, some old tires, and a heap of stuff John couldn't make out. He had been following behind the truck for some time as he considered calling the police. After all, it looked like the truck could lose half of its load if it hit a bump or turned too quickly. As if reacting to his thoughts, the truck suddenly hit a bump and out came a bunch of random items that sprawled across the side of the road. John got out and gathered up the stuff. Most of it was random junk, but mixed in that pile of scrap was a samurai sword. John was no weapons expert, but the thing appeared to be authentic and old. He threw the sword in the front seat and the rest of the junk in the back and headed off home. Later that day, he showed his wife what he had found. She too was surprised by the sword. When she asked him where he had gotten it, he said it fell off the back of a truck. He couldn't help but smile a bit. John replaced his baseball bat with a samurai sword by his bed. By 2007, he hadn't had an opportunity to use the blade, but John had trained himself not to react to the changes that occurred before the greys would appear. He had learned several important things about the greys over the years, and he was confident they could read emotions and possibly even minds. He was sitting in his living room one afternoon watching TV and working on some motorcycle parts when he felt the environment shift as it had done many times before. He remained calm and focused. He kept his mind blank and in his zen state he used his peripheral vision to watch for the greys to peek out at him. Suddenly one appeared in the sunroom just out of the corner of his eye. He gave them no signs. He stood up calmly and went to his room where he grabbed the samurai blade and placed it behind the door in the bedroom. He proceeded back to the TV and pretended to be distracted again. He noticed two more greys appear beside the first. He got up once again, went to his room, grabbed his samurai sword, and came around from the back side of the sunroom. He could see the three greys inside and the screen door was wide open. He composed himself, took a deep breath, and then charged as hard and fast as he could at the three, sloshing quickly and powerfully with the blade. He struck cleanly and sliced one of the greys' heads off. The other two dissipated immediately, but the dead one remained. He had struck, shot, stabbed, and fought the greys many times before, but nothing had seemed to phase them or stop them from disappearing at will, until now. John gathered up the corpse, wrapped it up in plastic, and stuck it in a freezer. This was his opportunity to prove his experiences to others, and John decided to send tissue and blood samples of the alien body to a professional lab for scientific testing. He came in contact with a scientist and researcher by the name of W.C. Levengood. In addition to sending the samples to a lab, he also provided Levengood his own samples. Upon review, he determined that the tissue and blood had unique properties he had never seen before, and that they were not a match to any known plant or animal. When the results from the lab were returned, a somewhat different and intriguing match was found for the samples. The lab had reviewed DNA from animal mutilations throughout Arizona, and found the blood and tissue samples to match trace samples found on the bodies of these mutilated animals. John understood this as proof of a connection between the greys and not only his mutilated animals, but other similar cases across the state and possibly the world. Over his years of research, John began to delve deeper into his understanding of abductions and decided to work with government medical doctors who, through regression hypnotherapy, 
helped John realize he had been abducted 18 separate times. He had no conscious memory of the abductions, but many of the times he had awoken with strange wounds on his body were actually times he had been abducted in the night. His wife had been abducted many times as well, however the exact number of times is unclear. Over time, John's work with government medical doctors revealed more and more about his abduction experiences. He and his wife consider the events too personal to discuss and refused to elaborate on what exactly happened. Over the next four years, John would kill at least 19 greys, according to his estimation. And by 2011, the ranch would be as active as ever. John's story had spread online, and he was receiving phone calls from people claiming to be psychics or attempting to tell him their stories. Oftentimes, he brushed these encounters off until he received a phone call from Brandy Howell. Brandy had been hired to help John by Cynthia Crawford, who had gotten wind of the ranch's strange phenomena. Cynthia was a twin and the daughter of a high-level member of the OSS, the progenitor to the CIA. Her father claimed to be privy to secret technologies, alien treaties, and Project Paperclip, established by the Nazis during World War II. Cynthia was born without an amniotic sac, and her father told her she was a human-alien hybrid developed in an OSS lab. But this story is better left for another episode. Cynthia related to John and his experiences and hired Brandy Howell as a favor to try and help him reclaim his ranch. Brandy told John that he was under attack by renegade aliens. She explained that she had been abducted many times since the age of four and developed psychic powers and a strange psychic link with something. She claims that after Cynthia hired her to investigate the ranch, she was told to take two aliens from the Sirius constellation with her. John and Brandy spoke for a while before setting up a time for her to come visit the property. When she arrived, she had two men with her whom she claimed were her Syrian companions. She referred to them both as Jay. According to her, the Syrians were a warrior race of aliens and that when you needed a problem taken care of, they were the ones you called. John greeted them outside and noticed that they were all carrying medieval-looking swords with them. He thought back to when he had found the samurai sword and pondered if there was some sort of link. Brandy walked the property and almost immediately pointed out a location to the Jays where she felt a disturbance of energy, a portal hub or congregating location for the Greys, as she saw it. Brandy and the two Jays performed a cleansing prayer in the house and at different points on the property. Brandy then told John that she had created another portal in the home and that some of the other aliens wanted to communicate with him. She said it created a doorway through which the aliens on the other side could speak through. A globe that appeared to be like a hologram from a movie appeared in the air and three beings wearing breastplates and carrying swords stepped through. Brandy couldn't see the beings, only John. John's wife would later corroborate the story and say that she saw the hologram and the strange lights in the room but like the others, she did not see the aliens that appeared only to John. After a strange and surreal conversation, Brandy got up to walk the property again. She claimed to have spoken with the animals about what they had seen telepathically. Brandy later explained that the aliens could kill the animals, but John and Joyce were off limits. According to her, the aliens were free to slaughter the animals without fear of consequence, but if they were to kill a human being, a being of another kind, stronger and superior, would intervene and punish them severely. That is why the aliens only tormented, poked, and prodded, but never killed him and his wife. They wanted them gone. They believed the portals in the property and the energies they provided were theirs. They did everything they could, short of killing them, to intimidate them into fleeing, but it hadn't worked. Brandy and her companions walked the property and continued to bless the area. They were facing the north side of the property towards the gate and the entranceway. She said she was raising the frequencies of the area around to make it more difficult for beings from other worlds to come through. Then they turned to face the south side of the property. The sky was a beautiful deep orange color, but as John and the others stared, in a blink, numerous alien craft revealed themselves in the sky above the property. One was the size of several city blocks, but it wasn't until John looked to his right that he saw what he deemed the mothership, a massive flying structure that looked like an entire city floating in the sky. Then Brandy spoke in a strange, low and guttural language while her companions watched in silence. She later explained that she was communicating with the Greys and letting them know that they needed to come with the other ships and leave this property. The uncloaking of the ships in the sky was a display of force for the Greys, a threat for them to leave the property. Brandy claimed that there were three ships with around 20 Greys per ship living on the ranch, or around 60 Greys in total. Brandy continued speaking in that strange language as clouds gathered above them, growing darker and darker. Then Brandy and the two Jays turned to face each other in a circle, raised their swords into the air until the tips of the weapons met, and purple lightning slashed through the sky, striking the earth just a handful of feet away from them. Stunned, John stood there for what felt like forever, staring blankly, feeling outside himself, until he snapped back and started to process what had just happened. 
Brandy was disoriented and a bit off. There was a ring of burnt ground left behind where the lightning had struck. The two Jays began hurrying off the property. As Brandy went to follow, she paused to tell John that she didn't think the Grays would be a problem anymore. And then she left. In the coming weeks, John would be in contact with Brandy about the incident. After the events, Brandy struggled with memory loss. One of the alien Jays that had been with her had reportedly lost his mind and been institutionalized. Whatever happened that day, it took several years for Brandy to fully recover from. The gray activity seemed to abate for some time, but the grays were not gone, and their interference with John and Joyce's life would continue. John would later learn that the two Jays that accompanied Brandy on the ranch that day were walk-ins. John goes on to explain that he hadn't known this at the time, but the two companions with Brandy were humans, born on this planet, but the soul or spirit that inhabited their bodies were that of two warriors from the Sirius constellation of stars. The two warrior aliens had made a deal with the men whose bodies they had taken, and as the souls of those men evacuated, the souls of these alien beings took their place. John claims to be in contact with benign alien intelligences, even today, ever since his encounter with the Syrians. He says he has been able to ask them questions about a wide range of the most impactful topics of human existence, and received frustratingly complex and riddle-like answers. In 2017, John and Joyce attempted to sell Stardust Ranch and move on to a new chapter in their lives. John said he wanted the new buyer to have full disclosure regarding what they were walking into. A buyer was never found, however, and the property remained unsold for several years before the listing was officially removed. On February 27th, 2022, John Edmonds passed away, leaving behind his wife, Joyce, and a property in financial disarray. Stardust Ranch still stands today, much like it was when it was first purchased by the Edmonds in 1996. It is currently in foreclosure and is likely to be sold at a bank auction. Perhaps its next owners will have new insights to give us in the future, or perhaps not. John believed that we are the actors on a universal or interdimensional stage, and that the fourth wall is occasionally broken by the directors of our play when they decide to interact with us momentarily. Whether extraterrestrial, interdimensional, a combination of both, or some other combination entirely, John and others in his camp believe that there are powerful phenomena beyond our full comprehension taking place on Stardust Ranch and other places like it. But what do you think is happening at Stardust Ranch? Are John and Joyce telling us the truth about their experiences? Leave us a comment and let us know. Thanks for watching.